So for this presentation, we're going to be looking at kind of a, the newest or most kind of emergent field um, or subfield in anthropology, something we call medical anthropology. And it's really looking at how do humans utilize various medical systems um, cross-culturally? And is there, um, you know, things that can be contributed by, you know, non-Western medical systems as opposed to kind of our Western scientific medical system? So the central questions that we'll really be dealing with is this kind of um, how does culture uh, shape ideas about health, right? How can anthropologists help solve healthcare problems, and why does the distribution of healthcare mirror that of wealth, right? Um, when we have these kind of profit-based wealth systems, we seem, or profit-based health systems, we seem to notice that um, a lot of that kind of um, people who are disproportionately affected by certain diseases or by lack of access to health care actually mirrors that of kind of wealth. You know, people at the lowest end of the wealth spectrum, of course, having the least access to um, health care. And what role does globalization play in uh, health care systems today? So if we look at kind of uh, how we define health, right, the real question is, is um, you know, what definition do we really use for health, right? The World Health Organization defines health as the absence of disease as well as complete mental and physical well-being, right? So this is kind of uh, an interesting definition. It's kind of very um, restrictive in terms of its uh, defining. Um, I don't know anybody out there that is at complete and utter mental well-being. Um, so really defining health will vary cross-culturally. So many uh, cultures define disease and illness differently from that, um, from how we define them in Western medicine. So anthropologists or medical anthropologists kind of make the distinction between an illness or the experience of being sick from a disease or the discrete identifiable biological conditions or malfunction within the body, right? So an illness could also include things like uh, spirituality and religion, whereas a disease is strictly um, physiological malfunctioning, but both of those are kind of incorporated under the umbrella term of sickness. One section of medical anthropology that has um, actually a lot of attention today is the anthropology of childbirth, right? And childbirth is essentially a cultural universal, well, at least a human universal, otherwise none of us would be here, right? But handling childbirth will vary cross, greatly cross-culturally, right? So studying how childbirth occurs in various cultures can illuminate differences in perceptions surrounding healthcare, right? For example, childbirth in the Yucatan and Mexico amongst indigenous Maya people is a private affair done in the home and under the supervision of a midwife, right? Uh, uh, on the kind of opposite end of the spectrum, we have childbirth in the United States, which is generally a medical procedure with the woman submitting herself to the hospital under the care of medically trained doctors. An interesting piece of study that came out of medical anthropology recently looks at this thing called the obstetric dilemma. Um, essentially, C-section surgeries during childbirth are up over 27% in the Western world since the early 2000s. Is this due to cultural factors or an evolutionary trend towards a more gracile skeleton, right? So this kind of evolutionary trend is, is known as the obstetric dilemma. So if we look at the figure below showing human birth canal size versus baby head size, right? So when we're you know, birthing these very large brain babies, sometimes um, there's not a whole lot of room in that birth canal for um, the baby to come out, right? So that's why C-sections have been kind of on the rise um, as well. So if we look at another um, thing that medical anthropologists look at, they look at kind of how pain is um, interpreted in various cultures. If we look at childbirth pain, um, pain is present in most, chi most childbirths regardless of culture, right? That's just kind of something that happens biologically. But focusing on the pain of childbirth seems to be a U.S. specific phenomenon. Most cultures do not administer pain medications out of fear that it will disrupt the birth process. So in most cultures, family members will provide emotional and physical support to try and negate the negative side effects of pain. It's really only in the U.S. and Western culture do we see a focus on kind of how painful childbirth is. So if you look at one of the um, things that come out of medical anthropology, um, it's this kind of notion of ethnomedicine or the culturally laden system by which people treat disease and illness. Um, also, it's the kind of health strategies and systems of a particular culture, right? So it involves the use of ethnopharmacology or the use of locally available natural medicinal elements such as plants, right? 
So although Western societies approach medicine, medicine through a scientific lens, they are also concerned with ethnomedical techniques, right? Examples would be uh, certain massage treatments that were borrowed from Asian ethnomedicine that are now used in Western ethnomedicine. So just because it's not a science-based medical system doesn't mean that they cannot provide us with legitimate medical procedures, right? So it's really kind of the goal of a medical anthropologist to look at all of these various systems and see how they treat illness and disease within their culture. If we look at an example of ethnomedicine in practice, we have the Tibetan Amchis, which are these traditional Tibetan healers. And the practices are based on seeking a balance between the spirit and the body. So the Amchi will actually use questions, examine fecal matter, and take notations on a patient's pulse, right? So Amchi treatments are noted to be effective for those who receive it, right? And the Amchis treat everything from depression to high blood pressure. So what you're seeing here is something very similar to what we looked at in Amma's Healing House when we looked at um, religious practices. We're essentially seeing kind of the internalization and the syncretism of medical systems, right? He, the Amchis um, use kind of some of the measurement techniques and some of the kind of Western medical um, scientific knowledge, as well as using their own traditional knowledge uh, of the plants and the local um, flora that helps them treat disease. So unfortunately, the Amchi practices have changed quite dramatically over the past century. The Indian government favors westernized medicine and has begun to kind of discourage people from seeking the Amchi medical advice. And market economies have also disrupted the traditional medicinal practices, um, kind of making some products far more expensive than the Amchis can afford. So the Amchis must uh, kind of run their med medical practices now like a business rather than relying on the barter systems, which have traditionally kept them going, right? As well as military activity on the Kashmir border prevents many of these Amchis from going across the border to collect some of the traditional medicinal plants that they use, right? So you're kind of seeing how globalization, how nationalism, how uh, uh, global or modern economic systems are kind of affecting this traditional um, practice. So if we look at kind of ethnomedicine in terms of a wrap up, um, all medicinal practices are considered ethnomedicine and all medicine is embedded in social processes and cultural phenomena, right? So local medicinal knowledge is always incorporated into larger medical epistemologies or larger medical systems. So looking at kind of the other end of the spectrum, of course, we have westernized medical practices based on biology or otherwise known as biomedicine, right? So these uses more kind of bodily invasive procedures like chemicals and surgeries. And the focus of biomedicine may vary cross culture right? So example for German doctors place more emphasis on natural remedies than do British or American doctors. So how westernized medicine is used will vary. Um, depending on which uh, culture you're looking at. So westernized medicine is rooted in kind of these enlightenment ideas from Europe, and it's based on the notions of diagnosis and scientific, uh, scientific observation and principle. So if we look at how biomedicine itself is conceptualized, we like to use the analogy of the human microbiome, right? Because humans themselves are not discrete independent entities, but rather a compilation of microbes, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses. You have hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of bacteria living in just your intestines, right? So we use bacteria in our kind of biological system to help us digest food, process minerals, and produce vitamins within the body, right? So we evolved with this microbiome and its recognition allows doctors to move towards an ecosystem approach to medicine rather than treating the body as a discrete independent organism, right? So it leads to a kind of a more holistic uh, medicinal approach, right? So our bodies are machines, but machines fueled by the cooperation of many species of microorganisms. So if we look at some um, variations in kind of uh, medical systems, we have the Chinese uh, medical system, which is based on the balance of energies between heaven, earth, and the individual known as qi. The uh, medicine is used to restore balance, and the practices will vary widely within China and abroad. So individuals in China will seek both biomedical doctors as well as Chinese medicinal doctors for medical advice, right? It's usually seen as an alternative to Western medicine, but is not an alternative, but more complementary if you were to ask any of these kind of uh, traditional Chinese healers.
another focus of kind of medicinal anthropology or medical anthropology is the um, kind of work to create public health systems in rural parts of the world, right? So anthropologists use cultural frameworks to promote systems which combat disease like AIDS and HIV or dysentery or typhoid and malaria. So if we look at an example, we go back to Paul Farmer from the 1980s in Haiti, and Farmer conducted a medical ethnography, and what he did, uh, the kind of the result of this research was launching a program called Partners in Health. Um, this later became one of the largest non-governmental organizations within Haiti, and it worked with Haitians to change water transportation systems, as well as provide basic sanitation infrastructure. More importantly, Farmer's or, uh, organization trained thousands of health workers to continue building the medical infrastructure within the country, right? So Partners in Health use nonprofit groups in the U.S. and other places to obtain materials and funding for projects. So this is showing you how medical anthropology can work with local uh, people to kind of set up medical systems. If we look at a kind of another study, we look at how um, disease is interpreted in various cultures, right? If we look at an example, we have Shirley Lindenbaum's work with Kuru and the practice of cannibalism in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, Kuru translates roughly to tremble or fear. It is a disease known as a prion disease. And infected prions essentially reach the brain and cause neurological damage to the neurological structures leading to dementia, tremors, and eventually death, right? This is common among the women and children of the Foray tribe in New Guinea, um, as well as a few other tribes. And it's caused by a death ritual which dictated that the women eat the flesh of the deceased relatives, right? So the kinship system among the Foray was flexible and prompted this kind of spread of the disease. But uh, based on the work of anthropologists, um, kind of convincing the foray people to transfer the souls of the individual into the pig of a body or the body of a pig, and then kind of eat that instead of the uh, deceased individual. So with kind of working with anthropologists and kind of working with that cultural framework, they were able to kind of diminish that prion disease. The last confirmed diagnosed case was in 2009. So if we look at kind of this notion of health transitions and economy, we know that health transitions are not equal across all communities, right? And what we mean by a health transition is the incorporation of modern medical advancements made uh, during the 20th century, right? So life expectancy cross-culturally is a prime example of or a prime uh, measurement or kind of metric that we can use to look at health disparity. And a branch of medical anthropology called critical medical anthropology treats health systems as power systems and examines how these disparities in health systems form, right? So this is focus, or the focus of critical medical anthropology is kind of on access to healthcare and the quality of that healthcare provided. So if we look at this kind of world life expectancy map, and this is kind of overall, um, you know, we can do it male versus female, but um, you can see that, you know, the United States, we actually do not have the highest um, life expectancy. Places like Canada and Western Europe, um, places that have more socialized um, healthcare systems where there's less of a um, disparity in terms of access, you tend to see that the health spans or the lifespans get a little bit longer, right? And in systems that use or kind of cultures that use for-profit systems as well as cultures that are still working on developing medical systems, you can kind of see that it begins to slide down from there, right? So for-profit medical systems in terms of life expectancies will get you most of the way there, but it's really that kind of uh, disparity in terms of access based on wealth that really kind of uh, keep us from gaining the same types of levels that we see in um, Western European nations as well as Canada and Australia. Um, and as you can see, when you move into kind of the more developed world, that's when you start to see um, your uh, life expectancies um, start to plummet because these are countries in which medical systems are not as adequately um, developed. So if we look at a case study in critical medical anthropology, we have this case study that was done by Kira Bridges and a women's health care clinic in Alpha Hospital in New York City. And after about one and a half years of observation, she noticed there was systemic discrimination based on perceived attitudes presented by the medical staff of the clinic, right? So in essence, women of low income were subjected to more intrusive medical procedures and interviews as part of being labeled as an at-risk patient by the Medicaid system, right? So the difference in the quality and access 
access to health care leads to varying infant mortality rates based on your social group. So what Bridges really noticed was that these women who were kind of forced to go through the Medicaid system were subjected to far more intrusive procedures and were viewed with far more skepticism and contempt by the people who worked at the hospital as opposed to women who were not on Medicaid who had insurance that went in for the exact same procedures. So, I mean, this graph here that shows the kind of infant mortality rate in 2015 based on income really shows you um, kind of uh, how uh, wealth inequality leads to um, poor outcomes for low income people in terms of health, right? And if you look at it, almost all, roughly, um, you know, pretty much almost all of the live births or the deaths that are occurring um, usually occur in low income areas in terms of infant mortality, right? And as you move into higher incomes, they have more access to medical care, better access to better do quality doctors, better quality hospitals. Um, so their infant mortality rates are very, very low. So in essence, because of our profit-based system, the babies of the poor are the ones that are suffering, right? We are uh, mirroring kind of wealth inequality in healthcare. If we look at the United States in terms of other kind of wealthy nations or kind of perceived as wealthy nations, we lag behind quite a bit. Um, we actually have a higher infant death rate than places like Slovakia and New Zealand and Hungary, right? Um, so it's really kind of every, per every 1,000 live births we have in the U.S., on average, six of those babies die, right? And the only real way we can kind of think about this or really kind of um, process these numbers is to really say, well, you know, there has to be something wrong with the medical system because the United States is wealthier than all of those other nations. So there really should be no reason why we should have this high of an infant death rate per 1,000 birth. So something has to be going on with the way our medical system operates. So if we look at how medicine has uh, and globalization have kind of intersected here, um, we have this notion of medical migration, which has become pretty commonplace in kind of modern society here. Medical migration is defined as the movement of disease, medical treatments, entire healthcare systems, as well as those seeking medical care across national borders, right? We're dealing with medical migration right now with um, the spread of the coronavirus, right? You're seeing a disease moving across many, many nation boundaries. So those who migrate for treatment are under something called medical pluralism or participating in the intersection of multiple cultural medicinal systems. So if we look at kind of medical um, <clears throat> migration in terms of um, organ trade, if we look at it, the yellow uh, countries are countries where buyers will travel from and the um, kind of pink countries are countries where buyers will travel to in order to find kind of organs, right? So what you're kind of seeing here is that in a lot of kind of developing world, there, are, there is a lot of organ sales going on. There's a lot of people selling their organs in order to kind of make ends meet. So the difference becomes even more stark when we start to look at the typical donors versus typical recipients. If we're looking at just kind of the kidney organ trade, um, the typical donor is anywhere from around 25 to 30 years old, um, generally male, and their annual income on average is around $480, whereas the typical recipient for a uh, donated kidney um, is on average 48 to 55 years old, male, and has a much higher annual income. So in essence, what we're seeing here is people from wealthier nations are essentially buying the organs of people from poorer nations because those people from poorer nations are simply just trying to survive, right? So in order to kind of fix this thing, we need to kind of figure out a way in which we are not using um, basically the, the, the poor and lesser developed nations and, and kind of other people as kind of replacement organ uh, donors for uh, wealthy westernized nations. So if we look at some of the kind of uh, new approaches that have been proposed by me critical medical anthropology as well as other medical anthropologists, we have this notion of illness narratives, right, which is how a person experiences an illness will kind of vary depending on the culture they live in, right? So the symptoms of an illness are the same regardless of a culture, but the interpretation and expression of those symptoms may vary, right? So by focusing on illness narrative, a disease can be more effectively treated, right? An illness narrative is simply the story that people tell that describe how their symptoms make them feel. So if we look at kind of these illness narratives, um, a lot of doctors have kind of started out with this kind of set of inquiries, right? Uh, what do you call the problem? What do you think has caused this problem? 
right? What do you think, uh, why do you think it started when it did? What do you think the sickness does? How severe do you think the sickness is? And what kind of treatment do you think the patient should receive, right? These are all questions that the doctor should be asking themselves as well as asking the patient themselves. So uh, with that being said, that's kind of the end of our presentation here and the end of our course. Um, I hope you all have learned an awful lot about various cultures from around the world. Um, and I tried to approach this class from more of a perspective of looking at culture as a system rather than just looking at kind of an overview of different cultures. But we did get to look at some information from the Trobriand Islanders as well as some groups in Africa, as well as some groups in South America, as well as comparing those or their cultural elements elements to what we find in our own kind of westernized cultures. So with that being said, I wish you all the kind of best of luck in your academic careers, and I hope that you all stay uh, safe and healthy in this uh, kind of age of corona uncertainty. Um, so with that being said, have a uh, wonderful rest of the semester, and of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I am always available.